today we're here to start talking about your brand new book, authored in conjunction with Rabbi Zalman Goldstein, yeah. called Raising a Loving Family. We have a copyright over here. This yeah. wonderful book, which I perused, still going through it. There's so much to digest in this one volume. And you, together with Rabbi Goldstein, you've done a, an incredible job of kind of concretizing so many of your principles that many people I've heard you speak about. And this book really kind of puts it into a capsule. Right. But uh, take us through and what, what motivated you at this point in time, in 2022, to put out a book. Any opportunity to share the knowledge and understanding of this sugya by me is a chayv kaddish. It's something we have to do. Mechayv. A lot of people ask me, are you going to write a book? A lot of good ideas, they should be out there. I had no time. I mean, I'm just inundated. It wasn't possible. And uh, Reb Zalman came to me after hearing some of my drushes, very, very misbala, misragish, and offered to put the draft together. He spent six months analyzing all the drushes and shiurim and all the rest of it, putting it together and make it into a draft, which we then edited the two of us together for, it took about a year, the project as it was. But the question is why? The, the answer is very simple. We started doing crisis chinuch and trying to help people understand how to reach and, and help the children who were struggling in our communities and help them find themselves and, and stabilize their lives and get, really get their lives back after going through years and years of struggle and rejection and hurt. For me, as I sort of developed in my own thinking about the sugya, I started expanding sort of trainings, especially through Keshe Nafshi, to help people understand the full sugya and to put it into context. And then it occurred to me that there was no context unless we talked about normative chinuch, like how's it meant to work. And if we understood better the basic principles under which normative chinuch works, whether someone knows it or not, most people do it by osmosis, they just, you know, kenenahara, they know. Their parents brought them up a certain way, their grandparents, they have a mesoira, and they do the kind of things we're defining relatively naturally. But what we realized was that understanding the context of what normative chinuch looks like was the opening, it was the gate that allowed people to then understand what went wrong so we could then understand, well, how do we help these kids? Mm -hmm. So it, it was a move towards sort of understanding the, um, the, the, the science behind it, the psychodynamics, the what is actually happening to you. No one chooses it. No kids choose, wake up one morning, you know, having a normal, healthy life and just say, ah, I think this is not for me. That doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. What we discovered was the reaction from the Olam as I started talking about juxtaposing normative chinuch to crisis chinuch to understand, well, how did it go wrong so we could then understand how to repair it? The reaction was that people were misspoil and misragish from getting a picture of what it should really look like. So this particular book, would you say it's for normative chinuch parents or would you say it's for parents who are involved in crisis Excellent. chinuch? Definitely. Is it for both? Both, absolutely. It's, it's pri the primary focus I wanted was for everybody. It was not about crisis chinuch. The primary focus of this book, Raising a Loving Family, was how to bring up the kids in a healthy way, create the proper healthy attachments, and we'll talk about that soon, right. in order that you could avoid the problems, or if the problems happen later on, you know, due to causes and processes that were outside the ability of the parents to prevent. Things happen outside it's the house. It's interesting. I've, I've actually heard parents say that parents who, are, who have children who are troubled, who are traumatized by different circumstances, mm -hmm. whether it's school, socially, or if they've been abused and the like, that once they implement crisis chinuch with some of their children, they actually have a hard time with the norm oh, of chinuch for their other people, children. And that's exactly what people started saying to me. People told me, why aren't you doing this as normative chinuch? Like, what's, why, why do you keep calling it crisis chinuch? Why don't you just do this for regular kids? And of course, the answer is obvious. If I'd ever get up and say, this is what you're meant to do, they laugh me out, the, you know, I'd be done. <laughs> and I understand that. 
But nevertheless, and as it, and as it is, though people give you a hard course, time. Of course, of course, and I, I respect that, and I understand that. We, we, we you know, we're we're uh, trying to be mechadish, a mahalach here that's both common sense, Torah based, and psychologically sound, and that's really what we're doing. And it's and it's developing. You know, it's, I've been working at this twenty years, twenty five years, and we've come a long, long way from just give mahag and everything's going to be fine. That's simply not true. But the point was the. You know, everyone knows the Maisim, the people quote in the name of different... I heard it, B'Shem Rav Schwab, Zeich Salev Rocha, that someone, a young couple asked him, a, a child was two, and when should we start with Chinuch? You know, the fa- everyone yeah, says say, this... It's already too it's late. It's already too late. Everyone says it, name of, uh, <laughs> it must be everyone saying it. It must be all right. the G'doy Leminet. But it's a pithy and a clever comment. And um, the idea of the book was to give... The, the understanding of how to do it to create resilience in children. This is what the book's about. Mm-hmm. The primary focus of the book was how do we develop resilience in children because what we observed was that the problems they were having, the different types of traumatic experiences that children were going through, that more or less good enough parenting wasn't helping them. And they would go off. And so you have regular nice parents, more or less doing exactly what their neighbors are doing, just regular nice people. <laughs> they're not abusive, not crazy. And they bring up their kids nicely, and suddenly the kids go off, and they're in shock. Because more or less good enough parenting isn't typically strong enough to help when, when trauma happens. So the idea was, let's give the information. Let's put it out there to Klaali Sol for how to strengthen the bonds at home, which is the foundation of everything, create children who are resilient on the off chance that things may happen to them. Worst is you're going to have amazing kids because you created resilience. The best is that even if trauma happens to them later on, which we now know is what the sugi is about. We're, I mean, less month you know, We all know that's the truth now. So when it happens... The resilience doesn't mean they won't be hurt. They will, and they will, they will suffer, and they will struggle, but they'll bounce back, because that's what resilience means. They will bounce back. So that was the idea, is let's create a book that talks about resilience, creating resilience in children, the bonds of home. And then we added, you know what, let's put a section on crisis chinuch too, so we have the whole sugya complete. That's so you're really saying really idea. everyone, no matter their circumstance, and even, I would say, even grandparents and, Absolutely. and other people outside of an extended family could gain a lot on the, Everyone, on the crisis level in, and also on the it's normative level. It's impossible to read this book and not gain something. It's impossible. I did not want to write a book that people would just say, oh, that was nice, and put it on the shelf. Mm-hmm. There are going to be ideas there that will be perhaps controversial, that perhaps will you know, incite debate and discussion. I hope so. I hope so. And, and I'm more than open to anyone calling, emailing as they do, respectfully, and, and debating and discussing the issues. No, the idea was that when you marry off your children, they get two copies. That was the idea. Mm-hmm. That all children at the chuppah, you know, every, they, right after the chuppah, I mean, I'm kidding, but, you know, we give them both a copy, and we say, read this. This is how you build your family. Now, before we get into specific topics, I do yeah. want to tell you what struck me about the book. Yeah. That's very unique, is that when you hear about a, a new book on Chinuch or a book on crisis Chinuch, you would think of a very heavy type of read. And this book is not like that at no. all. It's very light. Yes. It's broken up into sections. You have stories, personal anecdotes, yes. which I loved. And um, part of the charm of the book, if I would say, is your vulnerability. You don't mind being vulnerable. You don't mind talking about your own challenges with your own children, which you've spoken about publicly in, in really inspiring fashion. That ability to talk openly about your own struggles, if I could call that, mm-hmm. um, and how you ultimately learned how to be resilient, I think is going to be a source of tremendous inspiration to many people. So at, at the same time, it's a very, very substantial read, but it's also very light. Yes, yes. My goal was cutting edge neuroscience, you know, concepts interwoven with, I think, authentic. I mean, I had Rabonim review it. I've had therapists. I've had the, the head people in neuroscience in the world review it to make sure we're, we're right, we're correct. 
But to take all that and put it together and then gift people with the idea that you can read this and understand, it, it just makes sense. It makes sense. Because if it doesn't make sense, what's the point? Right. So, but let's, let me ask you, Yes. Uh, get right into it. Based on your experience, 32 years, you've guided so many people. If you could give our viewers an idea in a nutshell, what is the biggest mistake or maybe two mistakes mm -hmm. that you find that parents are making from early on and obviously into crisis, but sure. what would you if, you, if you could give, you know, we have an opportunity here with a wide audience. What, what are the two biggest mistakes that people make? <laughs> Well, I'll speak from personal experience. Okay, is that okay? Yes. I don't know about everybody else, but I can tell you about me, and I can tell you about all the people close to me, you know, that we talk over these ideas. The, you know, the Torah tells us, there's a vav on the end, his derech. And the Gorn even says very, very clearly that you have to go and try and extract from a child and see what's unique about him and then help him direct those unique trunas and kreichas. You have to direct them towards your fulfillment of your life. And if you don't, then Kiyazkin, when he gets older, he's going to be by it. He'll leave you. He'll run away from you. We need to look at the individual needs of a child. So when we were young parents, it never dawned on us ever that we should be looking at the unique needs of our children. It seems like the children of those times were, were resilient. And despite the lack of a focus on the yachid and, and right. the overall focus on the cloud, they kind of made it through. That's right. it, was only, it was only late 80s, 90s, and now exactly. as so we I move on that we really right. saw the kind yeah. of... because it wasn't possible to last. We were inspired. We were the children born after the war. The G'day Yisrael inspired us. Mm -hmm. And they made us feel like we were responsible to help rebuild Klal Yisrael. We saw it, we felt it, we lived among survivors. It was so tangible and clear to us. Whereas children today have no clue what you're talking about with that, that we need every one of them. On the contrary, the message they get is if you don't shtel tzu and do it our way, then you're out. You come to my yeshiva semi on probation already. And the feeling of so many of the kids is exactly that. There was no such thing by us. By us, it was like we were looked at as like, you are the future. Go build the future. Because we expect it of you. So we were very, very inspired. How, and I think a we, lot of the resilience came from that. But how do we reinstate that feeling to our youth <laughs> that they're indispensable and that they're so, not expendable? So that's a very, very big subject. I don't think that's for today. We need a course for that. The, the, the reality is we have to work that out. But if you go back to the what was, again, the word mistake, by necessity, that was the mistake we made. Mm -hmm. and, and we paid a price but for that's it. That's more of a, what I would call a communal decision. I'm, I'm asking more specifically on an on a individual level what parents could do. That's well, well, again, it, see, it comes out of that because uh -huh. what we didn't do was take a look and focus on the resistance our children were giving us, the, 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 the discontent, the unhappiness, read the signs. We were never told to read those signs. On the contrary, you know, to a lot, I spoke about emotional neglect a little while ago. To some degree, we did that. We all committed that. You know, if they would tell us, I don't like yeshiva, they'd say, Red, this is I, what are you talking about? Of course you love yeshiva. You know, mm -hmm. and, and you would talk them into it. You right. wouldn't say, why not? Right. But it was too scary a there question There was very little validation. Very little. Because, again, we were coming out of this world where there was no room for that. If we were going to survive and recover and rebuild, there was no room for that. But in this generation, I think that children have gone back to needing, look, it's worldwide, it's nothing to do with the Jewish world. We are affected, whether we like it or not, to a large degree by the secular world around us. I have uh, many drushes on this subject of what happened to children. But the reality is the children in the world at large, and certainly this happened to our children, as we come maybe towards Mashiach, Chutz Biyansky, maybe that's what we're seeing. But the fact is that what, we d what, what today's children the way they speak to their parents without thinking about it. One generation ago, you get Sve Petch in a heartbeat. You would never, we'd be terrified to speak to our parents that way. And today, they shrug you off. It's the world, there's no particular family. So what that's begging is attunement. What it's begging for is that we as parents attune ourselves to understand and feel what the kids are feeling.
so that we can relate to them and then guide them just like that means guide them to their uniqueness and give them a vision and a place where you fit in Klalisol. Where do you fit? Because if we're going to tell all the kids everywhere that you're all going to be G'day Yisrael, when we know that's simply not true, we have to find a way to aspire, you know, inspire our children that they should aspire to the greatness they can all achieve, but in a way that's realistic and truthful and reflective of who they are. I, I want to use that as a segue. It was really a question I was going to ask later on. Yes. But I find that it's a perfect segue to a question I want to ask. You're talking about giving every child the feeling that they're important, that they're an important component of Klai Yisrael, yes. that they're productive, sure. they're going to feel fulfilled. What do we do in today's current chinuch system with a child, let's say specifically boys, where learning is the emphasis? A boy who doesn't connect to Gemara learning between ages 10 and 15, He's just not connecting to the Mishnayis, to the Gemara. The message he gets by the time he's at the end of elementary school is that he's, he's really not worth much because this is the, the curriculum, this is the protocol. What, what hope is there and what should be the approach with such a child? Well, the, to answer this truthfully, we need a two, three-day conference with a, a couple of hundred Mechanchim who've been in the field 20, 30 years people who've been working with kids on the streets and no kids too, we need to sit together and debate and discuss and think this through. I don't think anyone has the answer to this. We have to work out how to make every child feel that when we look at them, you are needed in Klalisol. Kabbalistically, we know it's true. Mm -hmm. Every neshama comes back for a purpose. Everyone has a purpose in this world. And the Ika Dagish to me, the focus should be on how do we convey to every child that Klalisol needs you. I had some of my children moved out of town. They went to communities where they said to me, married, after they got married and settled, they said, I want to live in a community where I matter. I want to walk into Shaw and know in the morning when I come for Shachris, I'm really appreciated that I'm there. Mm -hmm. I want to come to a place where I can offer and give something, where my Jewish identity has passion and meaning. I think it's doable. And you've been known to say, I don't remember the exact statistics, but you've been known to say that our current educational system works for, uh, what is it, the top well, no, it works 20, for every, no, 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 it, 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 I've been misunderstood on this. I want okay, to be very so clear. I'm, I'm glad we have an opportunity I, I've to I've said like this. I, I've said that I see the system is doing an amazing job considering what it's received and how it's trying to do what it's doing. You know, we're not looking at Rishon, we're looking at Sadiqim. The system is manned and stuffed by Sadiqim. All I've ever suggested is like any responsible and mature community or organization, we ought to be self-reflective. Mm -hmm. We ought to be able to handle criticism. We ought to be we ought to be willing. I embrace it. When I speak publicly, I always ask if someone's bothered or hurt, and I always get it. If you're hurt by something I said, please send me an email. I'll try and do better next time. I don't mind. I think we our system should be and is strong and healthy enough that it should be self-reflective and self-critical and ask these questions, these hard questions. That what, what I've seen is this, what you're referring to is the sort of the 20% who come out of it who are beyond magnificent products. Mm -hmm. Little Sadiqim, they're just Kanei Nahara. I mean, just Kanei Nahara. And you see 20% who by the time they're 18 are not effectively governing their lives by Shulchan mm -hmm. Well, What's your answer? I know there's a, there's a, a difficult question, but I'm, I'm going to ask it because I know people would want me to ask it. Sure. What do you say to those who will say, Rabbi Russell, you, you're, you're tops at what you do, but you're speaking from the psychotherapist chair and you're surrounded by crisis all day. You're not there in the trenches, in the classroom, sure. in the day-to-day, -day, what we have to deal with in the world of Chinuch. What I work with are products of the system. M most of what I'm working with are actually mainstream young people who are in the system, still in the system. I don't want to say which yeshivas and which seminaries, but they're still there, part of it. And they come in wounded and hurting and upset about what their experience is and why they don't really understand why they're in such pain. 
but they, they're struggling with it. You know, where you know, a boy can be in a mainstream yeshiva and refer to going away and having an off Shabbos, and it took me a while for the penny to drop what that meant. Mm. What that meant. And it was painful. And a boy with a hat and jacket in a mainstream yeshiva having an off Shabbos. You understand? I am exposed throughout. So certainly most of my work with young people is actually with people in the system, not out of the system. The parents, that's true. I work with a huge number of parent body who have kids who are off. But the, uh, most of the young people I work with are very much part of the system, want to be part of the system, want to find meaning in the system and are having a hard time doing that. They're struggling with it. Number two, I don't know I have the answers. But someone has to ask the questions. And, and I feel that I know what all I've ever tried to do in the world of Chinuch. People say I'm an expert in Chinuch. I, I, I'm not sure what, why they say it or what they mean. I don't know. But all I've ever tried to do, all the years, 30 years, working in the community with our world, the Ilam Atayra, is share what I've garnered from the children, what they've experienced and felt, and share that back to the system in a way that I hope will be constructive, supportive, non-judgmental or critical, because I'm not, but, support, but, but help them take a look at, is there a way we could do this better? so that the kids wouldn't feel so rejected or shut down. I, I share back what I learned from the children. That's it. It's not very complicated. Mm -hmm. And I try to share it in a way that's, that's not critical or judgmental, but is honest. Is honest. I mean, honestly, if we can't sit back and take a look at ourselves and reflect upon ourselves. What is the, the heart of Yadus? Isn't that the heart of it? I say Slachlano every day. Am I not actually thinking about how I may have messed up? Why is it so hard for us? We are so strong. Kanenahara, the Hebrew gave us this gift. We are so strong. Why can't we sit back and say, hmm, I wonder why? Why don't we take the graduating classes and give them 50 questions and we'll embed in those 50 questions some of these questions and see how they're actually feeling and let them know it's all private and confidential. We'll get it done by an outside agency. Now, in your book, you, on a little different note, you highlight the importance of Shalom Bayes. Yes. It's a major, major part of the book. Yes, it is. Talk a little about that. First of all, what, what does it mean that there is Shalom Bayes? And and how does that carry over to the chinuch of the children in the long sure. term? Sure. Well, can I, let, can I back up and then yeah, go, sure. we'll go back here. The book, the premise of the beginning of the book is about creating healthy attachment with our children. Resilience, um, resilience is built through the healthy attachment we have with our children. But the idea being that if we can create an environment where our children feel safe secure, seen, and soothed. This comes from Dan Siegel in Parenting from the Inside Out. But if we could do that, create that environment where it creates safety for our children, where they feel safe to talk to us, where they're not going to have their emotions, feelings denied when they say, I feel this way, or I hate my school, you know, and we actually explore that with them to understand why and what. We have to create security with our children in the home and the family where they feel secure in our love and support and, and in a whole host of ways as the book describes. Uh, our children need to be seen. This is what we discussed before. We have a chayv kadosh to make sure each of our children know we see them. Not that we're just bringing up a bunch of kids. It's the kid. Again, all this wasn't necessary 30, 40 years ago up until then. This is the world has changed. This is the premise we're built on. Amal, it was good enough that we did this good enough, more or less, or whatever. That's what the Olam seems to believe. However, if we uh, look at the on honestly at the children from today, we know safe, secure, seen, and soothed. They need the soothed that when they get in trouble or they have a problem or they get in trouble in school or wherever else it is, the first thing we do is soothe them. That we're there for him, Shafel, I'm with you, I'm here for you, and let's talk it through. That creates resilience in our children, and guess what it does most of all? It provides and facilitates that should, God forbid, some form of trauma happen to our children, they will come to us because they feel safe and secure with us. They will not feel judged. The key is 
when it happens, the quicker that we get effective treatment to it's help like the, them. It's like the refuah kaidam lamaka. That's yes, really what it is. Exactly. Now, in that, the role of shalom bias is clear to me. The greatest gift we ever give our children is the love you give your spouse. There's no suffolk on earth to me. That's not a fridge magnet. That's a fact. The greatest gift we give our kids is the love you give your spouse. It creates the security, the confidence. It creates in them everything they need, the love, the caring, and it allows and facilitates for them to turn to us for help and, and seeking help. If they have problems in life, they know we're there for them because we model it. And I'll tell you something else we model. People always ask, what does that mean? Uh, you have to have perfect shalom bias where you can never disagree with each other. Again, it's nourishkeit. You know, a, a healthy husband and wife should disagree with each other frequently. I think HaKadosh Baruch Hu created that way. Nasalai eze kenegdai. Everyone says kenegdai. She's opposite him. Her help is by not being him, is by being kenegdai. So it makes you like think twice. So there's always an inevitable tension, it should be, between Zohar and Nekeva. This is the way the Ebishto made the world. That's not a problem. On the contrary, that's very good. I'll tell you why it's good. Because if we model how, as husband and wife, how we deal with that tension, that dissonance between us, the perspective on different things, the fact that Anisha has Bini Yaseira, I always say, Yaseira from whom? Who does she have more Bina from? him, right? That's what she's got. So the fact is, if our children witness that we can be different, we have different perspectives frequently on different aspects of life, but guess what? We process it maturely, healthily, and lovingly. What we're actually doing is inoculating our children. We're giving them a vaccine for life where resilience, the core, the core of resilience comes from that experience where they know I will go into the world, meet people who are different to me, and I've already learned that there, you can have people with different opinions living life differently to you, and it's all good. The one of the chapters that comes after that is on trauma because the real issue of why our children struggle so much is because of traumatic experiences. So in theory, you could have a home that was not the most model citizens in terms of love and safety and security and all the things, the good things we describe in the first few chapters of the book, but their kids never get exposed to trauma. And they somehow manage to wander through the system and do just fine. If you can encapsulate why do otherwise regular children from healthy from families decide at some point, I've had enough, I'm going off. Okay. Well, what would you, how would you answer that? Well, no one decides. First of all, it's not a decision. It happens. They drift off. They drift off. It's, it's not like one day they wake up and just say, you know, I'm done, right? It's been happening for years before that ever happens. In fact, if we would, again, do the research properly, most cases we could know by fourth grade. If I would sit with a fourth grade, and I've done this around the world, with a fourth grade classroom, with the Rebbe and teachers who know, preferably primary, first, second, third with them, and the fourth. By fourth grade, I could tell you who's more likely to go off and who's not. Just by sitting with the teachers and Rebbeim and going through the nature of the children. The problem is like this. We have different types of traumas. You know, people think trauma is like a single event, disaster, you know, a near-death experience. Obviously, in the last 10 years, the word complex trauma has, Baruch Hashem, come into the world where, you know, we used to call it developmental trauma or relational trauma. Now we're calling it complex trauma. And complex trauma is really a, it's not complex that is complex. It means a multitude, a myriad of micro traumas together where each one had that been the only thing happening? Garnished, nothing. Mm -hmm. Water off a duck's back. But when you experience that every single day, constantly in your life, cumulatively, it has the same impact on the brain. Neuroscience has done this research that complex trauma has the same impact on the brain as single event near life uh, threatening or life threatening experiences. And so it takes part of the brain it diminishes the activity in the prefrontal cortex, which means you cannot think 
clear. You rationally. can't have rationally. Right. So we're sending kids who have experienced complex trauma. Again, I don't think this is the time to expand upon. You can see how the drosh mm -hmm. is where I talk about it. But if we look at complex trauma alone, just that, and, and certainly what happens in the cases of abuse, where they have multiple layers of trauma because the kids get abused and then have to live through privately in shame, rarely able to acknowledge that to their parents. They're ashamed. And if they've been abused years before and bubbling up inside them was a relationship towards the very things that the Hashkafa of Hatznei Aleches denies to a child and internally they're handling with it because of abuse that happened to them well, then that creates complex trauma where the kids are going to be devastated and want out of the system. And they don't even know why. This is one example. If you didn't know the signs or read the signs, then you probably did what your parents did to you, trying to keep your kids in Shteltsu because you were scared they'd get thrown out. So you got tough on your kids and you let them know because you just got to let them know, right? Just got to let them know. But you didn't have a clue that you were actually seeing the symptoms of early trauma. No one told you that. You never even thought about it. It never dawned on you. It could even be possible. And therefore, everything you're now doing is contradictory to helping your child survive. And then eventually your child goes off and you wonder what happened to us. We're nice people. I'm transparent in the sense that we went through struggles, a lot of them with, with our children. As Mashkiach once said to me, Matisio, my Rebbe, Shlita, Shavu Shalema, he said to me one time that, he said to me, Shimon, if I was the Rabbi Shalaylam, I'd only give you struggling kids. I wouldn't <laughs> waste my time with the others. That's I, so I, nice of him. <laughs> yeah, zero. And he said, I hope you take this in a nice way. I did. Because it's al Shemayim. The gift of our children gave me meaning in life. It was a synthesis between us. They helped us, my wife and I, become who we are as we, in turn, tried to help Which, them. Which, by the way, you have a great line are. in the book right at the beginning. You oh, know what I'm talking about. Yes, that's why it's there. Where is it? That's why it's there. The journey of parenting. The journey of parenting. I have to read it. Go ahead. Raising our children is not only about who they become, but also about who we become in the process. That's it. That's, that's it. it. That's it. That captured the book. We, we were looking for what to say there, and Zalman and I came up with Incredible. that. Incredible. Now, on, on, you're talking about the, these children who, let's say, we'll call in your language stage four, stage four crisis. So one of the questions I got in crisis... Should we establish what that means first? Yeah, yeah maybe Just help understand. our viewers. Yes, yeah. because it, 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 it's confusing. It really, really, people have to read it to understand the yes, different it, stages. It, it, right. right, exactly. Right. But stage four would refer to a child who is constantly at war with their parents, really bitter, angry, fighting on their parents, probably Kashrus is out, Shabbos is out, they're out of school or in and out of every other school every week, you know, basically miserable, depressed, sad at home, you know, and, and, and quite possibly not in school anymore. Very possibly have already started drug use and most likely are involved with physical relationships with members of the opposite gender. Four out of six is the worst, so to speak, the most difficult level of crisis, what you just right. mentioned is stage four. That's what we're talking about. Those kids who are really usually mid-teenage years in enormous pain, enormous pain, where parents are really scared and they, they feel in so much pain. Hmm. So, and one, of, one of the struggles of those parents, which I think creates the resentment, is really this question. And that question is, in crisis, and we're talking about stage four, what is considered crossing a boundary? Making a mess in the house, finishing all the food in the fridge, which is minor, but you know, the, the, these kids come in with their friends, they take over the house, cigarette butts or other items all over your porch, or are we just supposed to just give in to everything? Basically, when you're dealing with that type of child, is there any boundary? Well, okay, so the boundaries are all to do with me and myself, not to do with my child. Uh, you have to understand that in crisis chinuch, we have now recognized that a child with these four out of six criteria we're looking at, we consider them in a state of self-kuch nefesh. They are really dabbling in dangerous stuff. And we know that unfortunately, the statistics are telling us worldwide, there's probably a death every day 
of a child between 15 and 30 from the from world from either a drug overdose or suicide. So it's a real issue. It's a fact. It's happening. Normative chenach is where regular parents have an obligation, chayv kadosh, to take a child who is really a para adam, right? Like ayah para adam yivalid, like the, the altar said, from an ayah para, a wild donkey, adam yivalid. We have to give birth to a person. They're born with a yaitza, they're born self-centered, not selfish, but they're self-centered, which they should be, because at birth they need to work on survival. Right? Absolutely. So the teething or they're hungry or dirty, they will scream and cry to get you up. They are self-centered, appropriately so, in order to survive. Otherwise, God forbid, they wouldn't. So the job of parents is to take that self-centered child, which again, not selfish, but centered on themselves for survival, and help them work out how to become a person who can live in a context of community with others too, while retaining the ability to be engaged with their own survival. How do we do that? That's the job of parenting. Normative chinuch is where we teach them how to do that. And we give them boundaries, and we give them rules and structure. And if you do it properly, it's all built on the primary healthy attachment where a child knows I feel safe, secure, seen, and soothed my parent. And if we do it properly, then when we set the rules, structure, and discipline, which all children need, a limit setting, a child embraces the limit setting as an extension of the unconditional love that my parents always gave me, so they naturally see it. They may not like it, and they chafe a bit, and they, you know, but the Misa, deep down, they know my parents doing this for my, my interest. It's an extension of that love, so they embrace the rules, structure, and discipline more easily. That's ideally how it goes, and then that goes into guidance when they become older, and we guide them with life. That's normative chinuch, but it's predicated on the safe, secure, seen, and soothed, on the foundation of healthy loving attachment, where basically there's nothing they can do that's wrong. They're zero to two, and whatever they do, it's just charming and funny. And even though they make havoc of your house frequently, but you laugh about it with them, and then you just straighten things out. But they are getting taught during those years of unconditional love. That's crucial so that when we come to limit setting in their lives, which is crucial for their life, their future, that they embrace our limit setting on them, not as punitive, or you know, not trying to hurt them, not selfish, but trying to help them. That's how they embrace it. When that, all that doesn't happen for a variety of reasons well enough, then when we start putting limitations on them, they resist the limitations. They, and if we use, in today's children, we use what was always done from dirty dirt, from the beginning of time, up until about 30, 40 years ago, which was withdrawing love and showing an angry face. That was how we did it. So when you wanted your kid to shtel to and go to bed, you showed them a very angry face and you withdrew love and they wanted your love so badly they went to bed. Today's day and age you do that and they look back at you and they say something nasty to you and they just cry and whine and complain and they're completely not touched by that. One of the things I saw early on which we borrowed from Christ's chinuch into normative chinuch, is that normative chinuch needs rules, structure, and discipline, just like schools. All schools and homes need rules, structure, and discipline. A, a liberal model of life is anarchy. It's terrible. It's destructive. It's just as destructive as the other way. They both de destroy children. They need the rules, structure. The only difference I say in normative chinuch is that today, for most kids, they need the rules, structure, and discipline administered with a smile with love. With, I say, I feel bad, Shafel, I'm so sorry. Mm -hmm. It's bedtime, whether you like it or not, I feel bad. Yeah, blah, 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 blah. And you say, yes, no, no, I understand. And it's all soft and kind, and then you walk them up to bed. But they still have to go to bed. You don't give in. Now, that's normative chinuch. So we give them rules, we give them structure, we give them discipline, we administer all the things, but we do it in a loving way in this generation, because that's what the kids need today. Whereas in previous generations, they really didn't. And I would guess that the 20% could handle exactly yeah, the yeah. absolute. No. And people say to me, but why take the risk? 
because they'll do just fine with the other way. As long as you do the rule structure and discipline, what difference how you do it? If 80% of the kids can only handle it with love and kindness, so why not just play safe and do it with everyone? Because you don't know which is your 20%. Yeah. Okay, I hear that. But nevertheless, I do understand that the 20% could have the old stuff and do just fine. Do just fine. Crisis chenach, what we've discovered is that the trauma that ate away at the kids was predicated on poor attachment. There wasn't the strong, strong enough attachment. In other words, we had good attachments with our kids, but we did not have good enough attachments. The unique circumstances of our life with our children, and one of them not being well as a young child, the unique circumstances for us deprived us of the ability, and we didn't even know the word, who knew the word back then, but deprived us of the ability to invest in getting healthy enough attachments mm -hmm. so that when the other things happen to them on the way, they're not resilient, they're not strong enough. So here's the concept. Crisis chinuch is built on repairing the damage of ruptured attachments with the parents where while they're in the crisis, the kids feel unloved, uncared for, and absolutely no desire or reason to want to return to this loving home because they don't see it as loving. So you saw number one on the list of the six criteria was they're at war with their parents. That war will absolutely obstruct any possibility of a child returning both to Torah mitzvahs and even to a healthy lifestyle, and it's life-threatening. It puts kids into a life-threatening mm -hmm. situation. So number one was to repair the ruptured attachments. Mm -hmm. When I saw this, I had learned some years ago when I trained in my early training about paradoxical intervention. I'd learned about it and I realized early on in crisis, that's what we're going to do. That means like this, with a, a child who's struggling, profoundly struggling, we can heal them better through their defiance than through their compliance. Mm. This yasad was so profound when I saw it the first time. I realized when a kid defies me and I come back in a loving and understanding way, they have a chance to heal the ruptured attachments that happened. Is that because they, they see that the love is unconditional? Exactly. Right. So then they up the ante and they test you even more. Mm -hmm. Because they, they want to know if it's true. I'm you're not saying, saying if they're complying and you love them, then that's, well, that's, that's the, natural. It's how do you love me because I dressed properly right. this morning. I don't know if you like. If you would know what's going on inside my head, then you would reject me, mm. which is what they hear in the system. Right. And, and it's all well-meaning. Don't get me wrong. You know, we want to. You know, you're not that shayless. You're not that guy. You know, they, they're meant to be machazic. It's the same thing with learning. If we, which we should elevate, limud hatayra, at the highest possible levels, which is Torah Lishma, is the best thing, and anyone who can do it should be doing it. And we should support all those who can. It's Pashat. At the same time, if the message is to all the kids that if you don't do that, you're second class Jew, there's no Mahalach for you, why wouldn't they go off? That causes complex trauma. Mm -hmm. Because if you hear that every day and you know you can't learn, it just you got you have a learning disability, you got sorrows in your life, whatever the reason is, you've tried. Your parents hired fifteen tutors, and it's still gate nished. And even if it goes in, the best you can do is a little bit of Mishnah Bura, maybe a little Mishnayis, but Gemara is out. And meanwhile, everyone knows the the pride and joy of the the Rebbe is the kids, the twenty percent. What do the other kids feel like? There has to be a way that we reach them and talk to them. But it's not so much about the boundaries. It's about the attachment. Oh, of course, that's, that's, a, that's the is. whole point. That's so it. when we, we tell the kid, Shefer, it's the same as a two-year-old. A zero to two draws on the wall that you just painted. You take the camera, you take pictures, and you laugh. It's a two-year-old. A kid who's in such a traumatic state of anger and pain and is doing all sorts of inappropriate things because of it, we obviously, chas for we don't take the picture and laugh at them like we do with the children, but we understand it's the source is just like that. It's pain, and we, what we want to do is exploit the moment to repair the attachment. This is what I tell parents. You, you don't understand. The last thing you want is boundaries at that moment. The last thing, you want boundaries for yourself in terms of how you behave and how you talk to them and how you act. And yes, you could, obviously, people are going to say, no boundaries, not true. There are times when you have to have certain, but even when you make the boundaries, 
you create alternative options. Because what we're doing is really repairing attachment. We're doing the attachment to save a life. It's Sofit Kuch Nefesh when they've crossed that line. Right. And the only way to save them, in other words, doing attachment work will not heal them completely. But without it, they won't heal. What I'm really trying to do is create in the hearts of these struggling kids that they have a desire deep down, which we can develop as parents, that they want to imagine getting married one day, sitting in my sukkah with their children, with their zayda in the sukkah. They want to imagine being at my Pesach zayda. They want to imagine being able to come to my Shabbos table because it's a safe place for them to be where they're celebrated and enjoyed for who they are. Because we don't celebrate these children, and we should. Because they're all made, but Salam Elohim. What happened to that? So what a crisis chinuch does, repairs that damage. And by repairing the damage, we create this internal, natural, God-given desire of every child to please your parent. We all feel that way. As an older adult, if you have parents who are still alive, you want to please them, make them proud. Hashem made us that way. So crisis chinuch facilitates that repair, reconnects the children where internally they want to make you proud and as they get older that's exactly what happens so they're now open to well-meaning street people mentors rabbonim the yeshivas like waterbury and other places who can reach the kids but they can't reach them you ask any of them they cannot reach them if we as parents didn't create that dimion inside my child's heart of sitting at my Pesach Seder one day and in my sukkah one day with their children, if we didn't create that picture, there's nothing they can do. But when we create that as parents, that attachment stuff, that longing, that desire is God-given. Hashem put that in us. And then all these wonderful people out there start exp you know, exploiting that drive to be reconnected mm -hmm. and they can then work with our kids. Do you feel, by the way, that you're a lone voice in the wilderness sometimes? Is that part of what frustrates you? It's not, it, it's not, no, 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 no. Uh, whether I'm a lone voice, I don't think so. I think there are many like-minded people. Maybe I'm an articulate voice out there. Could be, could be. No, what frustrates me is the pain of the children. That's what kills me. I sit with young people every day who are in such crazy pain. And what's amazing is when you work through that pain and you connect with it, you turn out these, these children are gems, they're diamonds, they're the kindest, nicest, most sensitive, and they're so hurting that this is taken from them, that our life was taken from them. That's, that's my frustration, that's my pain. It's not about, you know, I understand that, um, this is all very new and to many people it's threatening and I embrace that. The truth is, people who know when they come to me, I look at every case as unique. I don't have sheathers. The book, I've done the best we can to avoid actually telling people what to do. Mm -hmm. That was very important to me. So it's more foundational, it's more about the Yisaitis than, than it is about practical That's guidance. exactly what I hope to write. Right. And, 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 and it shouldn't be read the other way around because the actual work with any individual family is nuanced. It's so unique. I've never seen two. Even the take of abuse. You know, two kids get abused, same age, same situation, and they're completely different in how they reacted to it because there are other variables. So you can't do it. It's impossible to say a set of rules. I mean, it will be a course. It will take, you know, a few years, like two, three years. We'll do a PhD course, you know, meet weekly for two, three years. Maybe we could cover the whole subject. But there is no other way to do it. People are unique. The Goran says, you know, the Rambam says, and I mentioned in the book, I was once saying at a Sheva Brach, I was like, how can they not even dome two people? So my brother was there, he's a bit of a mathematician, he's good at that. So he said to me, well, he said, it's obvious. He said, he said, if every middah, there's shivim koichas the nefesh, right? The Goran brings it down from the Zayas. 70 koichas that make up personality. Well, if each one varies by just two variations, eichas and kamas, frequency and intensity. So how angry you get could vary by frequency, how often, and intensity. So every middah varies by, and it's really infinite, but let's say it's just two. So two to the power 70 is what? 
Turns out my brother's sitting there, the shepherd. He says, well, two to the power, I think it was 36, I think he said, is more than people that have lived since Adam Mauritian. Mm -hmm. So two to the power 70, it's not shy two people are the same. Well, if two people can't be the same in the inherent tchunas they brought back to the world, they're then impacted differently. Well, how can you give shitas then that will be precise for every person? It's impossible. Thank you again for being here. Any final message that you want to give the viewers yes, yes, if before I can. we wrap up? The message is attunement. If you read the book, it's about us in this generation changing the patterns of previous it was not needed in previous generations. You know, kids were seen and not heard. You know, that's the way I was brought up. We were whacked, we were caned, you know, and we grew up and that was the way the world was. This world, that's not true anymore. We have to be very clear and strong about rules, structure, and discipline, both at home and at school. With regular, I'm talking about bringing up regular family, not crisis, I'm talking about regular. Yes, we have to be firm about it. That firmness has to be associated with love and caring. That's called attunement, that we tune into their hurt and their feelings and their pain, and we do it with sensitivity and kindness. But when we nevertheless step back and enforce our rules, structure, and discipline, we make sure we do it with love and kindness in this generation. That's how we create resilience. That's what I'm urging families to recognize. We prepare and we, we vaccinate our kids to some degree from life struggles and problems later on by doing this kind of deep attunement without compromising rule structure and discipline. On the contrary, it's the way we administer and support them. And I think if we could do that, we're going to incredibly change Clown Lissant. If And that's really what the book's about. Well, you, you've brought a tremendous amount of light and relief and encouragement and chizik and guidance and direction to so many people. You're continuing to do it now in this brand new book. So Mazel Tov on the Thank book you. and Thank really you. continued Hatzloch and Tziyat HaDashmaya with your Avayis HaKadosh. I, I have to mention your Rebetzin as well, yes, who's an equal partner yes. in everything you do. 100%. Not only does she guide people, but she enables you to do what you do. So 100%. much thanks to her as well. And continued Hatzloch in all you do. And, and most thanks to my children who went on this journey. We did it as a family. And we worked with each other and understood each other and grew from each other. And I have the greatest respect for them. And I'm grateful that I receive the greatest respect from them. Well, Klai Yisrael is grateful to them as well <laughs> for, for their role in, in enabling their father to, to become that paragon of compassion and passion on this very, very important issue, which, again, has helped so many people. And Amir Chishem will help many people in the thank future. You. So thank, thank you so you much. Right.